Thanks, Jeremy. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, this is Invisibility, Erasure, and a Jewish Tombstone in Roman Britain. So as far as I can tell, the last time that an article was published about the possibility of Jewish residents of Roman Britain, the United Kingdom was still on rations. It was Shimon Applebaum's 1951 essay, Were There Jews in Roman Britain? Citing some literary sources, some names, a few numismatic finds, and some other material evidence, largely from the continent rather than Britain, where evidence for Jews is more plentiful, Applebaum makes the case for the likelihood of Jews living in Roman Britain, even though there is hardly any evidence, and most of it actually is from France. Part of the explanation for this dearth of research on Jews in Roman Britain since then is the very lack of definitive evidence that Applebaum observes. There is very little in the way of clear evidence for Jewish populations in Britain during the Roman period. Identifying specifically Jewish material remains is notoriously fraught in almost any geographical location. This is because there are always questions of whether it is possible to distinguish Jews from any other Roman person, even as Ross Kramer has shown, when iconographic elements like candelabra or menorah are present. Assumptions that Jews were always clearly self-identifying as Jews in the material record, or that they were unlikely to have made use of the same imagery as their non-Jewish neighbors, likewise do not hold up making positive identification of specifically Jewish material evidence tricky, reflecting the slipperiness of diaspora identity. In light of these issues, I'd like to suggest employing a hermeneutic of imagination when examining this limited collection of evidence. Eve Sedgwick writes, hope, often a fracturing, even traumatic thing to experience, is among the energies by which the reparatively positioned reader tries to organize the fragments and part objects she encounters or creates. Because the reader has room to realize that the future may be different from the present, it is also possible for her to entertain such profoundly painful, profoundly relieving, ethically crucial possibilities as that the past, in turn, could have happened differently from the way it actually did. Sedgwick reminds us that while historical events may or may not have happened, the realm of possible events is far broader and more imaginative than we give the historical record credit for. So instead of assuming the absence of Jews in Roman, the Roman British historical record without definitively Jewish artifacts, I hold that as scholars, we would do better to hopefully imagine Jewish presence wherever we find Roman settlements, even if it is not possible to clearly identify Jewish material evidence. Given what we know of diasporic identity, being overly cautious in the name of maintaining academic suspicion presents its own dangers. Approaching the material record for evidence of some unifying Jewish identity rather than of a more complicated relationship with an imagined homeland, as Hall urges us, prevents scholars from recognizing a fuller picture of Jewish diasporic life. The current minimalist approach to locating Jews in antiquity risks erasing them altogether. Reconstructing the lives of ancient people requires some imagination, regardless of how much evidence there is to work with. Some scholars are already doing this imaginative work, however cautiously. David Noy writes, for example, it is perfectly plausible for relatively small urban settlements to have a substantial Jewish community without any inscriptions, end quote, giving the example of Menorca, for which the only evidence of a Jewish community is a Christian polemical document. The paths that our imagination takes in framing this evidence can be bound up with hegemonic structures inherited from the long legacy and ongoing reality of Christian supremacy. Annabelle Wharton warns us that, quote, we are all continually responsible for eliminating the other through lapses in the idiosyncratic hegemon hegemonies of our own memories, end quote. She continues, Hegemony incorporates material culture in the construction of the story of its own dom dominance. Recognizing the archeological residue of the subordinate group in an ancient society requires legible identifying signs. Without such signs, a structure is absorbed by the prevailing culture. In other words, the location of our scholarly stance as inevitably within the confines of Christian hegemony creates the risk and reality that unmarked or neutral evidence is subsumed into the dominant culture, 
This is true in the context of pre-Christianized Roman Empire, as well as later, since Jews have always been non-dominant in those contexts, and Christian supremacist thinking has governed the study of ancient Judaism and of antiquity generally for centuries. Jewish erasure, as discussed later, has ramifications within and beyond the study of antiquity. In this context, I offer a case study, an overlooked second century tombstone currently housed in the University of Glasgow's Hunterian Museum. This tombstone could suggest a Jewish presence in Roman Britain, and it's this piece of evidence that I'll use as a test case. The tombstone's owner, Salmanes, the 15-year-old son of Salmanes Sr., had the misfortune of dying uh, around the Antonine Wall, not far from present-day Glasgow. Thankfully, for my purposes, Salmane Sr. paid to erect a monument for his son. Why were father and son in Britain? How had they ended up at the Antonine Wall? Do the other people buried around Salmane's Jr. give any clues to their way of life or place of origin? This paper encourages imagining full Jewish participation in the ancient world, and with that, the possibility of Jewish lives in the far reaches of the Roman Empire. The gravestone was unearthed in 1726 in Dumbartonshire in Scotland during the excavation of a tumulus in the same location. As is suggested by the crack running through it, it was found in two pieces lying separately from one another. The little scholarship there is on this artifact describes the name as Syrian, Semitic, or merely Eastern. Tomlin goes as far to say that Salmanes is, quote, a good Semitic name, which in English becomes Solomon, end quote, but does not entertain the idea of Salmanes being anything other than Syrian. The Blackwell Companion to Roman Britain says that Burley calls Salmanes Jewish, but I haven't found that in any edition, and so I think um, that the uh, Blackwell Companion has merely elided um, or sort of merged the idea that Semitic is Jewish, which um, is not uh, the case and is not how the term Semitic is used to describe definitively non-Jewish examples um, from Palmyra and Syria, for example. I suggest that the presence of the name Salmane should lead us to imagine the possibility of a Jewish grave. <clears throat> the stone includes the words Desmanibus, and is decorated with a wreath, uh, what are possibly palm fronds and some rosettes. Reading this imagery is as fraught as attempting to categorize any ancient iconography as belonging uniquely to one community rather than another. As Eric C. Smith observes, quote, we have come to accept it as a given that images from antiquity must map inevitably onto discernible and discrete religious systems, end quote. Even though such rigid definitions, rigid identifications correspond neither to what survives of ancient evidence nor to what we know of the realities of ancient, nor frankly contemporary, image production and use. Some specific elements of the Salmanis tombstone bear exploring in further detail. The presence of the phrase dismanibus on the stone would be enough for many to discount the phrase, um, the possibility that Salmanis is Jewish. Dismanibus is an invocation to the gods of the underworld, a phrase whose use many scholars assumes excludes strictly monotheistic Jews. However, Kramer points out several examples of inscriptions in which Dismanibus is used for a burial in which the deceased is also referred to as Eudias or Eudiah. Thus, the presence of the burial formula should not exclude the possibility of a Jewish grave. Palm fronds have been associated with the Lulav and the Sukkot um, on other Jewish graves, but in this case, such a possibility is not mentioned in the scholarship. As Kramer has shown, palm fronds are far from uniquely Jewish. Thus, if they are palm fronds, they are not a strong indicator either way about Salmane's identity. However, it's also possible to read this image as a menorah. The menorah was not in use by Jews in the material record prior to the first century BCE and um, really only explodes as a symbol in the centuries following the Jewish war. When hundreds of examples appear in diverse contexts in the ancient Mediterranean and across the Roman Empire, wherever the diaspora stretched, as Smith writes. In the Salmanes tombstone, what might be palm branches and might be menorahs have widely spaced arms. This is in contrast to the typical appearance of palm branches with shorter fronds more closely spaced, but it's not quite identical to a typical menorah either, especially as there are nine arms rather than seven. There's a general assumption that the seven branch menorah 
is the norm before the late medieval period, but actually there is a diversity of styles of menorah in the archaeological record in antiquity from five to nine armed and beyond across a range of geographical locations. Good enough states that, quote, the number of branches can by no means be taken as a criterion for unmistakable menorahs have a varying number of branches. Another point in support of reading this object as a menorah is that the representations on the tombstone appear to have a base <clears throat> represented by um, a short line underneath the central stem. This is not typical for palm branches, it's not unattested, but it is more typical of menorahs. Um, figure 770 in Good Enough's uh, third volume shows an image with a central stem, a triangular base, and 20 long straight branches. Um, I think if this is a menorah, it's um, it's got a lot of arms. So I think this is maybe an example of a palm a palm branch with a break, with a base. Um, and likewise, um, this these two images come from the same inscription. Um, I just didn't want to draw the middle bit. Um, this depicts what might be a menorah on one side with the curved branches and the base, um, and a straight seven branched object with a small linear base um, on the other. So if the first image of the curved arms is a menorah, it seems unlikely that the second one with the straight arms um, is, which means it must be another palm branch with a base similar to what we see in the Salmanes monument. And these sketches illustrate the variety of ways that menorahs and palm branches are represented in funerary monuments and should in turn encourage scholarly flexibility when reading monuments like that of Salmanes. We cannot be sure what we are looking at, let alone whose religion it belongs to. It's possible that outside a locale where specifically Jewish funerary imagery would be in regular use, whoever inexpertly carved this memorial relied heavily on their familiarity with the palm frond and adapted it to resemble, however loosely, a menorah. The question remains though, whether the use of the menorah in iconography sig signifies a bounded religious identity at all. While some readers may not be entirely convinced by my readings of the designs on the mortuary monument, this is in fact part of my point. The way we approach these inscriptions and the categories we employ to analyze them constrain our abilities to identify Jewishness. We must expect slippage in the iconography that we encounter. Our comparanda, compiled carefully in numerous volumes consulted for this article, are selective in that they represent a data set of Jews who chose to display their Jewishness in ways that scholars 20 centuries later would identify as Jewish. To presume that Jews are always readily identifiable relies on a dangerous assumption that Jews are always distinctly other, separate and set apart from their surrounding communities. The grave itself is found in a military context. It's at the Antonine Wall. Peter Salway in his book, The Frontier People of Roman Britain, outlines some of what likely take, took place at that camp, including the presence of traders and merchants from all over the ancient Mediterranean, making pottery, blacksmithing, and selling wares to homesick soldiers. In the camp itself, merchants set up open front shops to sell their products. It's in this context that most scholars have imagined Salmanes to live, putting forward the possibility of him traveling alongside the army, army as a merchant from Syria. Salway, however, proposes an alternative context, which is that Salmanes and his son may have been freedmen or enslaved workers under the service of a local fort commandant. He reminds us that there's no evidence that Salmanes was a traitor at all, and observes that the other tombstones found in the same vicinity are also those of freedmen. On the other hand, the other graves include possibly higher ranking civilians, since two, two of the tombstones are funerary banquet uh, types with the deceased depicted in civil dress. So we are just as able to imagine these alternative lives for Salmanes, given the evidence. Whether as an independent trader, as a freedman or an enslaved worker, migration is a key factor in Salmanes' existence at the camp. While evidence for Jewish migration in antiquity is likewise delimited by exactly the methodological issues under discussion um, today, namely that the absence of evidence is frequently taken to be evidence of absence, there was substantial amount of migration by Jews around the Mediterranean um, and beyond in the first century and early second century CE, particularly after um, the Jewish revolt during Trajan's reign. Jewish migration all over the diaspora occurred during the Second Temple period and immediately after it in areas which were under Roman authority. 
Given how much we already imagine for Salmanes and his life, I want to suggest that we examine some of the points which suggest that Salmanes could be Jewish. The strongest point in favor of considering Salmanes a Jewish uh, name is the, is the name on the tombstone itself, or rather the two identical names of father and son. As Kepi notes, it's possible that both of the names inscribed should be read as Salamanes rather than Salmanes. Um, the initial spelling of the second line appears to be spelled Salmanes. Let's see if you can see that. Um, you can kind of see it um, a little bit, but not very well. Um, and there's also the correction of um, a superscript E on the top line um, that you can see. Um, and this correction was done in antiquity. <clears throat> The single names suggest that neither father nor son were Roman citizens, since um, Roman citizens usually had three names, prinomen, nomen, and cognomen. The name Salmanes or Salamanes has received attention and scholarship only that it is indicative of foreignness. Most commentators go into little detail um, other than suggesting the name is Eastern, uh, but Collingwood and Wright give some information about potential parallel inscribed names similar to Salmanes. They suggest parallels with Syrian gods or theophanic names and imply a non-Jewish identity as a result. Pal Ilan's exhaustive volumes on Jewish names in antiquity include a few references to Salmanes and its variations, though she does not include this particular inscription in her collection. Um, she notes that Syria counts as Palestine when um, discussing this in her first volume, which covers Palestine from 330 BCE to 200 CE, um, on account of the porousness of sort of political and geographical boundaries. In that volume, she also notes that Solomon as a name is not attested in that region and time frame. Um, and this is in line with other names um, of biblical heroes, such as Aaron and Elijah. In other volumes covering different geographies and periods of time, Names akin to Salmanes are attested. Ilan notes that the, the name Salmanes is found in the Septuagint as a transliteration of names like Shalman and Solomon. In Ilan's second volume covering Palestine from 200 to 650 CE, um, she does include both Greek and Hebrew examples of the name Shalman. These examples, Ilan notes, are not always unequivocally Jewish, further confirming that distinguishing Jews from non-Jews in antiquity is frequently a difficult business, confounded by the phenomenon of what Margaret Williams calls crypto-Semitic names, in which um, a Jewish name is concealed within a more dominant name from within the repertoire of the dominant culture. It's true that variations on the name Salmanes are used in contexts that are not likely Jewish. For example, there's a dedicatory relief found at the sanctuary to the god Bel at Dury Ropus, dating to the early Roman period. This relief, which likely depicts the god as well as a person making an offering, is made by a son of Shalman. However, despite the overwhelming scholarly notion that all Jews must have been strict monotheists, it would be irresponsible for us to make a priori assumptions about this son of Shalman. In other words, to discount the possibility of individuals making offerings and participating in multiple religious communities and identities simultaneously. Ilan lists further examples in volume three covering the Western diaspora from 330 to 650 CE and in volume four, the Eastern diaspora. Two examples of the name are found in synagogue inscriptions from Dura Europus, both of which date to 244 CE, although one of these inscriptions is a label for the King Solomon, so not particularly useful here. The other commemorates the donation of an historical person of that name to the synagogue building. Another attestation to a similar name, Salomo, is uh, present as a graffito on the lintel of the door adjacent to the synagogue, which Noi dates to around 240 CE. This graffito is in Aramaic as well as Greek, and alongside the name Salomo refers to an Isaac, a Jacob, and possibly an Aaron. Another example found at Palmyra and dating to post 150 CE is considered by Elan to be possibly Jewish because the inscribed Salmanes is described as the son of one Simon, a name she considers Jewish, but this inscription is also flanked by known Syrian non-Jewish deities. Likewise, we know of examples of Jews with distinctly Palmyra names. These examples from Syria illustrate not only the possibility of a Jew by this name, but also, once again, the complications around Jewish iconography and identification in antiquity. Pessimism in the academic world is nothing new, and neither is pointing out its dangers and limitations. 
Sedgwick's essay, Paranoid Reading and Reparative Reading, provides an important correction to this normative mode of critical discourse in the academy. While paranoia has its many benefits, Sedgwick proposes moving beyond questions of what we know and congregating instead around questions of what knowledge does. Knowledge is not neutral, but rather has an effect on the world around it. This has, of course, been noted among biblical scholars, such as Elizabeth Strusser Fiorenza, who observes the limitations and dangers of uncritically upholding positivist scientific approaches to historical to historicist biblical studies. The hermeneutics of suspicion, a useful way of approaching evidence, has nonetheless limited our ability to imagine Jews in antiquity. Since Jews are a minority group in the ancient world, scholarship treats pagans or much later Christians as the normative demographic. This makes sense given the numbers, but without imagination, such a critical stance is limiting. Without specific evidence of Jews, there are no Jews. Interrogating the material and textual record for hard evidence of Jewish existence indicates a paranoia. Jews do not exist unless we can pin down exactly what proves someone is Jewish. Thinking about how knowledge works reminds us that such paranoia risks the erasure of Jews from the historical record. And it is not as if historians are opposed to imagining a wealth of other details about their subjects' lives. So far, quite a lot of imagining has taken place in the history of scholarship on Salmanes and his son. People have imagined all sorts of things about his life, his job, his reason for being in what is now Scotland. But it is surprising to me that only one scholar and another author of historical fiction have imagined the possibility that he might be Jewish. Why would our default assumption be not to expect Jews in Roman Britain? Why should we expect that all Jews label themselves as Jewish in some way that is obvious to us? Of course, however imaginative we might want to be, sound scholarship is based on evidence. There is indeed a cluster of evidence for the possibility that this is a Jewish inscription. First, it seems likely that Salmanes or Salamanes came from Syria. Since most examples of the name come from Assyrian provenance, and since we know about the president, uh, presence of Syrian archers at the Antonine Wall, it seems reasonable to investigate the presence of Jews in Syria as one way of thinking about Salmane's identity. We know there was a significant Jewish population in Syria in the first and second and third century CE, and we have examples of the name used in synagogue inscriptions from towns in Syria, which on the whole seems to have had an incredibly diverse population. Though the credibility of Acts as a historical document should be viewed with suspicion, Acts 9-2 suggests that there was one, more than one synagogue in Damascus, a claim that would have needed at the very least to seem probable to its audience. Dura boasts several religious and linguistic communities living side by side from before the Roman period and beyond. It also represents quote, our best source for the day-to-day -day life in a small town situated in the periphery of the Greco-Roman world, says Kaiser. This day-to-day -day life includes dozens of various sanctuaries, including a Mithraeum, a synagogue, and a house church, in addition to many other non-Jewish, non-Christian religious spaces. Karen Stern's work on the synagogue at Jura demonstrates how Jewish modes of memory making are locally bound. She writes, quote, memory practices were neither uniform among Jews throughout ancient Syria, nor were they likely so elsewhere in antiquity, end quote. If we are to imagine Salmanes as a Syrian Jew now living much farther north in the Roman Empire, he should remind us that his modes of memorializing his son are likely to have reflected his diaspora environment rather than a constructed and anachronistic normative Judaism. This diversity should also serve to remind us of just how many communities were interacting with each other, sharing spaces and languages, homes and public spaces. It should remind us of the ways <clears throat> in which identities, even identities striving to put up boundary walls, are hybrid and permeable. Kramer observes that this line of thinking, which chooses not to imagine Jews without marked evidence for participation in normative Judaism, relies on the assumption that, quote, the accommodation to the dominant culture ultimately leads to the demise of Jewishness, end quote. Stuart Hall reminds us that there are at least two modes of understanding identity, one which is stable and uniting, and one which is slippery and marked by difference. This is especially the case, as Hall's research on the Caribbean demonstrates, in the context of the colonial experience, 
in other words, and to re retroject Hall's ideas back a few thousand years in the context of diaspora and of an empire under which minoritized peoples lived. He urges us to recognize that ident identity operates on two axes, quote, the vector of similarity and continuity and the vector of difference and rupture, end quote. We risk losing the fuller picture when we ignore the less fixed axis. The difference, the difference comes from displacement, from the experience of diaspora, where one is both identified with a homeland, but where one by nature of being displaced is also not belonging to that homeland in a straightforward way. For Hall, diaspora involves, quote, the recognition of a necessary heterogeneity and diversity by a conception of identity which lives with and through, not despite difference, by hybridity. In antiquity too, we find both types of identity being constructed, both unifying and rupturing. For example, as Shana Scheinfeld has shown, to be, quote, Torah observant in the first century has no fixed meaning. That is, while the idea of Torah observance always refers to the idea of Jewish law, there is no agreement in ancient sources about how the laws themselves should be understood or observed. Just as I discussed above, the inscriptions associated with Jewish burials, um, Jewish, uh, in the inscriptions associated with Jewish burials, Ross Kramer observes how slippery inscribed signifiers are. If we come to the evidence with preconceived notions about how Jews express their identities in antiquity, if we expect those markers to be unifying rather than disruptive, then we risk missing important examples of diaspora Jewishness. This paper's title invokes the terms invisibility and erasure. I use these terms because it's easy to lose sight of invisible things and people. Jews in antiquity often blended in with their cultural surroundings, producing material or literary evidence from time to time, but which likewise is upholstered to match the culture which produced it. How or whether we are able to identify the presence of Jews via artifacts and other archeological materials, um, for example, by the inclusion of menorahs or lack thereof, remains thorny and complex. That is not to say that these elements should be completely disregarded in our analysis of Jewish life in antiquity but minimalist approaches to the material record leave us with a world bereft of diaspora Jews. In this light, my approach to the funerary marker of Salmanes contributes to the ongoing discussion about the complexities of interpreting Jewish life and death throughout Roman antiquity. In some sense, then, the bulk of Jewishness in antiquity is invisible to the naked eye, and we must use our imaginations to reveal it. The second word, word in my title, erasure, is the result if we fail to hopefully imagine these invisible Jews. Both the elder and younger Salmanes urge us to imagine the likelihood of Jewish presence throughout the empire, and to be aware that our own presuppositions about what it means to be Jewish in antiquity can affect the kind of evidence that we see. Wharton urges us to be mindful of the ways that Christian hegemony was, has dictated and continues to dictate the methods and approaches we employ as a guild and the limitations that result from those delimiting categories of analysis. The funerary rites of Roman era Jews were very similar to those of non-Jews of their era. We see in the archaeological record of Syria the diversity of the population in language and religion, and we see the evidence of synagogue inscriptions made by or on behalf of men named Salmanes, which also sometimes included elements that surprised us, such as non-Jewish gods. When we prioritize our suspicion of ancient evidence, we construct an epistemology, epistemology in which most Jews are likely invisible. Constructing knowledge in that way is damaging and potentially dangerous since it reduces the Jewish population. What's more, it rests on standards that are not adhered to for other categories. The identity, livelihood, and life story of Salmanes is, are all richly imagined, but his Jewishness apparently must be proven. Yet there is material evidence of a multi-ethnic Roman presence at the northern edge of empire during this period. I find it easier to imagine the quiet, unremarkable presence of Jews in Roman Britain than I do to imagine that not a single Jew set foot on this island until 1066. What I hope I've pointed out is that when we apply an understanding of diaspora and when we employ a methodology of imagination, it becomes less difficult to find space for Jews. It's difficult to suggest areas for further application beyond Salmane's memorial. Rather than offer specific suggestions for further work, I encourage 
listeners and my audience and any readers of the published article to reconsider article um, artifacts that they've already observed, perhaps ones that are not considered Jewish, as well as any that they come upon in future through a more imaginative lens. In this way, we can begin to undo the assumption that Jews were always a recognizable other, aliens within their surrounding communities. In remembering Salmanis in this way, I hope this paper helps us um, imagine the presence of ordinary average Jews in the world, whose archeological record in being somewhat unremarkable demonstrates how cautious we need to be about our assumptions of how identity is displayed or performed. This caution is especially important in light of the rising threat of fascism and anti-Semitism in the past few years. Wharton writes, quote, the desire to eliminate the ethnic other from the cultural present involves the removal of the material evidence of their presence in the past, end quote. In contemporary white supremacist imaginations, the Roman empire holds a place of special prominence. The stakes for erasing Jews are high. While I do not suggest that most present day scholars have nefarious aims to support white supremacist enterprises as some of our predecessors have, we have a responsibility as scholars not to provide father, fodder for racist ideologies such as Nazism and other fascist campaigns. Imagining a Roman Britain devoid of Jews aligns with the aims and beliefs of white nationalist movements currently gaining momentum in the UK and elsewhere, despite or perhaps because of our commitments to academic rigor or impartiality. Regardless of whether we are anti-Semitic or racist ourselves, the fact of systemic anti-Semitism and systemic racism exists. We are obliged to work against epistemologies that emerge from those systems, not simply to follow the well-worn paths they have created. The erasure of Jews from antiquity, some of which can happen through vandalism or through racism, is just as dangerous when it happens through forgetfulness, omission, or I suggest a lack of imagination. Uh, and here's some of my works cited, just a very select bibliography. Thanks, everyone.